Hello, and welcome to The Higher Aim of Art. Bo Bartlett is an American realist with a modernist vision. His paintings are well within the tradition of American realism as defined by artists such as Thomas Aikens and Andrew Wyeth. Like these artists, Bartlett looks at America's heart, its land, and its people, and describes the beauty he finds in everyday life. His paintings celebrate the underlying epic nature of the commonplace and the personal significance of the extraordinary. Bartlett was educated at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, where realist principles must be grasped before modernist ventures are encouraged. He pushes the boundaries of the realist tradition with his multi-layered imagery. Life, death, passage, memory, and confrontation coexist easily in his world. Family and friends are the cast of characters that appear in his dreamlike narrative works. Although the scenes are set around his childhood home in Georgia, his island summer home in Maine, and his home in Pennsylvania, or the surroundings of his studio and residence in Washington State, they represent a deeper, mythical concept of the archetypical universal home. On March 1st, 2019, Studio and Kaminati was honored to welcome Bo Bartlett in his lecture, Let Your Root Feed Your Crown. The purpose of art is to wake us up. I used to say uh, uh, the purpose of art was to wake the viewer up, but it's uh, slowly morphed over time, uh, and I've exchanged it, I changed it to us because it's, it's about waking us up as the creator as well. As artists, we, we wake up when we make art. So um, it's, it's, it's waking everybody up. And you can wake people up uh, roughly. Uh, my dad, when I was a little boy in, uh, in Georgia, he would come into my bedroom and he would flick the light on and off and make a bunch of noise and say, wake up, wake up, it's time to go to school, wake up. Um, so when I grew up and had kids, uh, I would go into their room very gently in the morning and just touch them gently and say, good morning. It's time to wake up now. One way isn't more valid than the other. You wake up both ways. Many different ways to wake people up. There's shock art. You know, you're just like, oh my God, I've never seen anything that looks like that before. And that wakes you up. And then there's... Uh, just the most beautifully rendered thing that you can imagine, a kind of Jordan Zokel, like, oh my God, that's so beautiful. You know, it wakes you up. So uh, I'm not a proponent of one way or the other, but the, the end, end point has to be that we have to wake up, okay? Uh, now and continually. This is the perfect example. This Norman Rockwell, um, this is the whole point, really. Um, He's discovered uh, the Santa Claus costume in his uh, father's, <laughs> father's drawer, the bottom drawer of his father's dresser. And he's, uh, you know, um, he's, he'll never be the same. <laughs> his worldview will never be the same. And uh, it's the perfect illustration of the point. It's what, it's what we all need to do, and it's what we, our art needs to do. It needs to help others do. Um, okay. It's a Rothko. Um, if you stand in one in front of one of those uh, incredible Rothkos, it can uh, it can do the same thing. Sometimes it can be a little gentle in its, its awakening, but it can uh, awaken your spirit. And you can see the color, and there's meaning in it. There, it's sort of hard to figure out exactly what it means, but it's like it's something. It's imbued with something. There's something in the paint, something about his emotions or his spirit. It's in there. When you see one that really is one of the good ones, it's, it's, there's nothing like it. Let your root feed your crown. Robertson Davies. Has anyone read the Cornish Trilogy? Oh, man, I recommend it. Uh, Robertson Davies, the Cornish Trilogy. It's all about art and what art is. Uh, there's three separate, three separate books. Um, I don't remember which one this was from. Uh, maybe Bread in the Bone. But um, I'm not sure exactly what it means either. But I, I think it means something about let... Um, Everything that you are, everything that your, your DNA, your family experiences, where you're from, uh, your own personal experiences, let that be like your roots that are down in the ground if you're a tree, okay? And you let those flow up through your body and flow up through your trunk and throw it through your branches and through your limbs and your leaves and your foliage and your flowering and you let that be the thing that comes up and nourishes you but also is the thing that you show to the world. 
So your root feeds your crown. Okay. So I really, um, I, I try to do this myself um, so that my, because we're all unique individuals, every one of us, and every one of us has a right to tell their story. And we all have different stories. So no matter how close we might be in our, in our uh, training or in our um, experiences, we all have extremely different stories to tell. And that's what it's all about, is telling your story, and it's true if you're true to your temperament and you're true to your roots, okay? Um, I like to think that a, uh, a kid growing up in, in South Georgia, sitting on the, the, the grassy field with that late afternoon grass sort of blowing in the wind, um, is going to have a very different temperament than a kid that's riding a train up in the Bronx, you know, like, like passing all the graffiti on the trains and all of the... Um, geometric uh, and colorful uh, visual cacophony. But uh, each person's going to have different experiences. But one isn't more valid than the other. Uh, we're all, we all have different experiences, but they're all valid. And so expressing uh, what, what your experience is and your, and your true temperament is what it's all about. And that's when art, expressing your true experience is when the art becomes true. Um, D.H. Lawrence said that uh, a fate that comes from uh, the outside is a false fate. So it has to come from the inside. Andrew Wise said your art has to be ingrown to be any good. You have to be ingrown. So we can. So I, I think of it as artists or art students is you just take all you can from everywhere you can and you sort of like process it through. It's like food. You eat it and it digests and then it, it serves to, for the health of your body. You get rid of what you don't want, you don't need, and then you're productive. But you just take it all in. You know, you don't put blinders on. You just got to, like, stay open to all experiences. Okay? Um, I'll flick through a lot of these. I have a lot of slides, a lot of images, so I'm just going to flick through some of them. This is called a new beginning. Mm -hmm. You can see some of the uh, references here that it's referencing. So... You know, the things, you have to take uh, a work of art as a signpost. So if you really love something, regardless of what it is, if it's Vermeer or if it's Norman Rockwell or Balthus or uh, Duchamp, I mean uh, Magritte, you have to just, uh, if you like it, that's a signpost for what you should do. That's the work you should be making. Like, that's a sign. Like, so I always believe in just doing my version of it. You know, it's not going to be a, a rip-off. Everything's influenced by everything. So just do your version of it. So that's what I've always... Like, so this is my reference, referencing both Rockwell and Vermeer and, and, uh, and, and Balthus and Magritte. So, you know, there's, there, there, he's got the pipe sticking in there. Uh, you see the pipe sticking out of his mouth, the, the, the Rockwell? And this is not a pipe. You know, he's doing a little in-joke there. I've got a pipe up on, the, on the, the dresser over there, on the bookshelf. Okay. I'm from Columbus, Georgia. This is actually a photo taken over in Alabama, but it, it feels very much like what it felt like when I was a kid in the uh, 50s and 60s growing up in, in Georgia, in South Georgia. Uh, um, I had a paper route, and uh, the papers were delivered right at an at a old building like that. You could go in there and get a little apple pie for five cents, a little, um, a little pastry, apple pie. Tasted so good. That's Walker Evans' photograph. Okay? This was my childhood home. And uh, I lived in Philadelphia for 30 years. And uh, I uh, lived in Seattle for 10 years. But now I've moved back to, to my childhood home. Betsy and I actually live here. It doesn't look like this uh, anymore. But this is, uh, this is my childhood home. Okay? Um, this is a, uh, the painting in the Philadelphia Museum, Groundhog Day, by Andrew Wyeth. Uh, growing up in Georgia, I didn't know much about art. My, my family didn't know much about art. Uh, I only knew what uh, came into the, into the house in magazines. That's the only way I could find out what art was, if it came into the house in magazines. Um, and so you had to be, uh, it had to be one of the really well-known things for me to know about it. So I knew about Picasso as a child. I wanted to be an artist because all I did was draw. And I wanted to, uh, I had some other options, but drawing was the main thing. Um, uh, I knew about Picasso. I knew about Salvador Dali. I knew about uh, Andrew Wyeth and Norman Rockwell. That was, that was about it. Okay. This is my painting of my parents. Um, 
my dad on the left. He was a, a woodworker. <laughs> uh, He's wearing the little American flag uh, pin, and that's my mom. She was a librarian. They're very different personalities. And uh, we are nothing but our parents. That's all you are. Now, yes, you've got experiences, but your actual physical body is just your parents, like, crushed together and all mixed up like that. And that's what you are. That's what we all are. Like it or not. Uh, so he's got, we've got this outgoing kind of guy, you know, and then we've got my mom who's more reserved. Uh, that that uh, rock, I mean that uh, Wyeth uh, still life there, sort of set up on the table with the Arnolfini wedding portrait uh, chandelier. It sort of has some Balthus influences and some uh, uh, David Hockney influences. And, it's, and I used uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's portrait with he and his wife by Sargent to sort of be the starting point. Okay? So these are some of the kinds of things I saw growing up as a kid on the cover of Life magazine. This is what uh, inspired me. This is what I thought art was. Okay? This is a painting I did in Philadelphia, actually, right over on Race Street, uh, Second and Race, where I had a studio for many years in the old lithographic services building. Um, it's a, a family a portrait. It's, it was my ex-wife and my, my uh, children at the time uh, in posing for this painting of a, a Christmas nativity scene. But it was inspired uh, in part by that Norman Rockwell. So it's a, in a schoolroom, but they're still having a little Christmas nativity scene. Okay? And that's the detail. Uh, the painting is called Estralita, which is Little Star. And this is uh, my youngest son, Elliot. I'd actually seen a, uh, a film with Hal Holbrook in it. Um, he, he was in love with a school teacher. It was an old black and white movie. I still don't remember the name of it. We could look it up. He was in love with a school teacher, and so he, he goes to the school, and he goes to visit her, this woman that he's infatuated with, and he goes and he looks through the door, the glass door of the school, school room, the classroom, and he sees these kids doing this school play inside, and a little boy's up on a ladder with a star. So I thought, ah, I need that. Okay. This is Elliot again, uh, going off to school in the school, school bus. So this is... Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I looked at him for years uh, getting on the school bus and going off to school. And um, there was just something almost melancholy about the way that he would, you know, leave. And uh, looking through this, the, the, the separation of me and him going through the glass, you know, the glass passing by in front of us with the reflections and all the other kids being irreverent and doing all the things that school kids do. Okay. Um, Growing up in the 60s uh, and in the South, football was like a religion. Uh, this is uh, Vince Lombardi with uh, the Green Bay Packers. Um, I remember Bart Starr and Roger Staubach and all the early football, football quarterbacks. That, uh, and Georgia was, you know, it's the Southeastern Conference and, and football is the thing. Um, okay. So uh, I remember going to my sister's uh, football games. My sister was homecoming queen and uh, watching her. Um, received the, the flowers and the crown. So this is a painting uh, loosely based on my sister and her boyfriend at the time. And, uh, but I actually had my son, my oldest son, Will, pose as, uh, as the football player, and his girlfriend at the time, Jackie, Jackie Merchant, posed for the, uh, as my sister with the flowers. Okay? And here's the larger version of the painting, Home Homecoming. Uh, and it's uh, in the Columbus Museum. And it's, uh, you know, it's the Columbus High Blue Devils against the Jordan Red Devils. And uh, I remember as a kid going down to the football field, Municipal Stadium, and uh, just the sound of the drums, you know, uh, these loud marching bands, that boom, 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 boom. It's like vibrating my thorax and, uh, and the lights and the smell of popcorn and peanuts. And so I, I, I put all that feeling and that memory. This is me as a little kid over here. My son Emmanuel posed for that. And... Uh, and this is the homecoming court and, and all the other girls that, that lost out to the, uh, to the one who won here in the middle. Um, but actually, I, I, I used all of my old girlfriends from junior high school and high school to, <laughs> to be the court. This is my dad over here. He's talking to Herb Wilkinson, the referee, and he's saying, you know, like, well, it's only halftime, but in the second half of the game, you know, let's, like, make it work out a little different. He wants them to win. 
I used a model car over there, that car on the right hand side. You know, I had like one of those little models that was only this big, it was red, and I just sat there and looked at it and painted it. Techn technologically, though, this is interesting because I haven't done this very often, but this was the uh, f first, I haven't done it too many times, but the first painting that I ever used Photoshop on. Like, I couldn't figure out. I had done the studies. I, you saw the, the portrait, the single portrait of the couple. I'd done all the studies, and I'd figured it out, but I couldn't figure out how to make their faces work in relationship to that fire. So I'd done a painting just of fire. So I got my son, Will, to say, I said, let's sit down and just see how we can make this work. So he, he sat down in Photoshop, and he, he put the fire from my fire painting onto the computer, and then he brought in the photographs of, of, uh, that I'd taken of, of, the, of the couple, and he put them right on top of that, and I was like, oh, okay, I see. I see how that could work. So we, he mocked up a little photograph this big of, of like what that would look like. But they were standing in the daylight. They posed in the late afternoon day, daylight. So, but it feels like with these uh, spotlights that it feels like it's sort of lit that way. But I could have never like, uh, figured that out without that technology. But I don't do that very often. Okay, next. Um, and this is... Uh, Love Feel, the day that uh, JFK was shot, and Jackie holding the flowers. If you go back one, can you go back now? Um, that, that you see that have her holding the flowers just the same way, and that's Jackie, his girlfriend. So this, this all harkens back to what was happening at the same time uh, that my sister was becoming homecoming queen. I was uh, in second grade, and, and uh, JFK was shot. Okay. You know, it's really changed my, okay, changed my uh, worldview, going from a kind of uh, everything was perfect sort of for a middle-class white kid in the South uh, during those years and then and then that happened so here's a we went I'd go deer hunting with my dad during that time and so here's a, a portrait of me as my dad and my son Emmanuel as me going deer hunting you see I don't really have a gun I have a stick and my dad has the gun and he's aiming and the painting is called Sightland I'm looking like actually like so, so sympathetic toward the deer that like I'm getting these little like the furry things on the hat are like becoming little deer ears. Okay. And this is um, called, uh, I'm sorry that it's sort of, uh, it's sort of digitized a little bit. I don't know why I did that on the, on the but it's, um, it's called uh, Young Life. And my sister's uh, boyfriend at the time uh, would go hunting and this was like a version of me over there, Emmanuel, I mean, Elliot, my youngest post for that. But he would go hunting and he'd bring these deer, after he'd shot the deer, he'd bring the deer over. And he would slide them, he'd put them in a cardboard box and slide them through our house, like, like as some sort of trophy thing. And everybody would be like, ooh, ah, you know, the number of points or whatever. So, um, and it, it was, and back then there wasn't, it was Georgia, and it was South Georgia, and there wasn't much uh, news. There just wasn't much news. So like if you shot a deer, you could actually go down to the newspaper and put it on top of your truck and they take a photograph of you and put it in the newspaper. So it was a big deal. Like somebody shot a deer. And so I remember that. I remember seeing a photo of my dad in the newspaper with a deer thrown over the top of the truck. And I was like, oh man, my dad's famous. Okay. But you see the way I chose to do the gun, the way he's holding the gun. Can you go back, Dan, real quick? Sure. Um, so yeah, you see the, the angle of the gun and the way that uh, he's holding it, okay. It relates to this Lee Harvey, the famous Lee Harvey Oswald photograph who shot JFK. So that's, that's him posing. That's the photograph that they used to prove that he was the assassin. Okay? Um, you know, we'd sit and watch TV when I was a kid. We'd actually like sit and my mom would make dinner and we'd sit and watch the evening news and the war was on the news. So Vietnam was on the news. And so we'd sit there and, you know, eat our green peas and look up and watch these horrible things of people being carried off into stretchers and to... Uh, uh, helicopters and uh, this is the famous uh, Newt photograph of the napalm girl they call it of the girl on the road uh, in Vietnam after na uh, American napalm bombs had been dropped okay and here's a painting called Damascus Road and so it's really uh, I use that that photo the famous photo as a starting point for, for this painting this is a large figurative painting done in the 80s as a group of uh, as a part of a group of paintings called the Automps which means all time but it, had to, it was a life cycle, life, death, birth, resurrection, and I'll get into this, okay? Uh, Martin Luther King, this was over in Selma. This is the Edmund Pettus Bridge. 
And this was, uh, you know, not far from Columbus. Uh, it was just over in Alabama. And I, I grew up uh, with the, the racial strife of the South. And uh, we, we uh, you know, it was like local news. Um, so this is the moment that um, Martin Luther King was shot uh, there in Memphis. Uh, okay. This is uh, from uh, Selma. There's a scene from Selma, and that's a scene from when uh, uh, Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald. I was watching that live on television. Did, was anybody else alive and watching that uh, live on television? A few of us. So I was in second grade, and uh, you know, they let us out from school. It was around Thanksgiving, but they let us out, and we were all at home, and uh, they were watching the, we were watching the funeral of JFK, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden they would cut away from the funeral. This is the way I remember it. And they would say, you know, we're transferring Lee Harvey Oswald out of the jail, you know, out of the, to taking him somewhere else, I don't know where. And they're transferring, and then all of a sudden on live television, you know, Jack Ruby jumps in and shoots him. So you're watching this as a little boy, like innocent, green-eyed little boy, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's like this horrible thing happens. Um, so it really, like, you know, it's indelibly etched in my mind, okay? And so, uh, you know, paintings come from these kinds of experiences. They come from, you know, here's, uh, it's a, a highway of sorts, and there's two, two di directions there in the middle of it, and between the two directions, um, there's a patriarchal figure on the right, and there's a sort of feminine figure on the left. Um, Madre del Nene is the title, Mother of the Boy. I'd read My Name is Asher Lev. Uh, has anyone read that by Haim Potok? Oh, man, you've got to read that. That's good. My name is Asher Lev. It's, it's not a hard book. It's a small, thin little book. I read it in high school. I was 18. And uh, my, one of my English teachers gave it to me. And she gave it to me because I, had, I came from a very religious Southern Baptist background, and I, but I wanted to be an artist. And she sort of knew that I was having that struggle. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I sort of, in a way, wanted to be an artist, but I didn't know what that looked like. I wanted to maybe be a preacher. I thought that would be cool because I sat in church and did drawings of all the, you know, every Sunday during the sermons, I would sit and and uh, draw what the preacher was talking about. I um, so, also sort of wanted to be a hobo. <laughs> I didn't think that would work out so well. A clown, I thought about being a clown, I didn't think that would be so good either. Um, so my choices were sort of preacher or, or, um, or artist. But my, one of my English teachers was bright enough to give me, my name is Asher Lev. And in that book, this Hasidic Jewish kid is struggling with wanting to be an artist, even though the, his tradition did not want him to make graven images. So it's that struggle uh, between whether to become an artist or not. And in the book, um, Asher Lev goes off to Florence, uh, Florence, Italy. And so um, that, yes, Dan. Um, and so this is uh, Madre Nel Nene has to do with one of the paintings that Asher Lev did. He did this painting called um, uh, the Brooklyn Crucifixion. And it was a painting of his mother being crucified. Okay. So since Asher Lev went to Florence, I went to Florence at 18, uh, out of high school. I decided to go to Florence and, um, and see what I could learn. Uh, let's go. And then I, I happened to meet on the street. I met an artist on the right named, uh, I met an artist named Lorenzo. He was from Australia. And I was just drawing. I was drawing some sculpture. I thought I was good. I was just like, you know, I spent like an hour on it. I thought I was good. And then, but I noticed people were walking by, and they would, they would glance at what I was doing, and then go over to this other guy and just like stand around him. He, he had a crowd around him. And so finally I got up and went over and looked, and he was working on this incredible drawing of this sculpture. And I said, wow, that's so great. How long have you been working on it? Six months. <laughs> He'd been working on it. So... Um, I asked him who the best artist in Florence was. I said, I want to study. I want to study privately with somebody. Who's the best artist in Florence? And he said, Ben Long. So I didn't know who that was, but I went over and I found out and I went and knocked on his door at 9 Via Degli Artisti. And uh, this beautiful woman opened the door. It turned out it was Diane, his wife, and uh, she was young. And it turned out Ben was only 30, but uh, to me that was old at the time. And, um, and I started studying privately with him. At the same time, he was studying with Pietro Anagoni. This is the Anagoni on the left. Um, uh, so he was, uh, he was the student, the apprentice of Anagoni, and I was Ben's apprentice. So we, uh, he would go study with, with Anagoni for half the day, and I didn't know where he would go. I didn't know where he was. And then he'd come back and he'd sort of like teach me some things. So it was, it was a really uh, great time and relationship. And I learned how to draw from Ben. I learned how to draw because he would sit me down and just have me draw a root or a skull over and over and over again. And he taught me how to see. 
um, when I was there, I asked uh, this group of artists, Charles Cecil and these other artists, the, uh, Cap, Capsner and uh, some of these other artists, American expatriates were there, and I said, uh, who could I study with in America? Because I'd been there for six months or so, or f yes, five or six months, and I realized that I had to go back to, to Georgia because my uh, high school girlfriend had written me a letter. Back then there was no internet, you have to realize that. There was no cell phones, there was nothing. And she had written me a letter saying that she was pregnant. So I thought, well, what am I going to do? So um, I was a good southern boy, and I thought, well, I'll do the right thing, and I'll go back. So um, I, I got this list of who I could study with in America from the, uh, from the expatriate artists there. And there were, uh, there's a short list, uh, Lack, um, Attila Lack was on there, Richard Lack, uh, and uh, Nelson Shanks was on there, and uh, Andrew Wyeth. It was about 10 people, but those were the guys up near the top. So when I came back to America and got married and had my son, Will, my first son, it was 1974, um, we, we moved to Philadelphia. Will was four months old and we moved to Philadelphia because two of the people on the list were from the Philadelphia area, Nelson and, and Andrew Wyatt. Um, okay. I, uh, I, I, I went to the top of the list first, and I, I found Andrew Wyatt's name, and I, I started calling uh, information. You could call, uh, what was it, 411? Can you still do that? 411? Is there such a thing? In the old days, you could just dial 411, and you could ask for anything and anybody, <laughs> and they would give it to you. And uh, it was a great time. <laughs> anyway, so I asked for Andrew Wyeth, and they gave me his phone number in Chadsford, Pennsylvania. And uh, I called him on the phone, and I said, Mr. Wyeth, it's Bo Bartlett, and I want to study with you. <laughs> and he's, and he, I could still remember, because his wife Betsy was behind him in the kitchen. You could hear her, like, doing dishes, you know? She was washing dishes. And, uh, and he was very polite, and he said, oh, I don't take students, but uh, come out tomorrow. Come out tomorrow, and uh, you can visit the studio. So I, um, I, I borrowed a car, and I drove out the next day, and um, I drove to his house. Like, I stopped at Hank's, at Route 100 and Route 1, and I, and I said, where's Andrew Wyeth's? So they sent me to his house. So I, go, I, go, I drive down to his house. I go down to knock on the door, you know, of the mill, the big stone. stone. If you haven't been there, you should you know, at least go look at it. And, uh, I drive down the long driveway and knock on the door, the half door, and Betsy Wyeth opens the half door. And she, I, I, it was the 70s, so I mean, I looked like Rasputin. I had this like wild hair and this long beard, and, um, and I terrified her. Um, and, and I said, is Andrew here? And she said, no, he's not, and I don't know where he is. Um, she was really scared. And so, um, and, you know, thinking back on it and the years and the timing and everything, she probably really didn't know where he was because at the time I just thought she was being rude to me. Um, but, she, you know, he was probably off painting Helga somewhere. <laughs> and she probably had no earthly idea where he was. Um, anyway, so I felt a little jilted. And so, um, you know, if I'd just driven across Route 1, I could have found the schoolhouse and I could have, you know, gone and visited his studio, but I didn't know to do that. Um, instead, I went back and I, I called Nelson Shanks. And uh, I was I'd enrolled at the Pennsylvania Academy. I was at the Academy, and I called Nelson, and he and I went out and visited him, and and uh, okay, and studied with him. Uh, this was a painting he was doing around that time. It's a self-portrait from uh, the early 70s. He just had his show in Allentown, and so uh, he was getting a little uh, a little bit of recognition at the time. Um, and uh, so there was another painter at the Pennsylvania Academy at the time, Sam Clayton, who was a friend of mine and a great painter. And so Sam was going out, and he was going to go out and visit Nelson, so I went with him and, and checked it out. And, um, the, at the time, the way it worked was Nelson painted right here, all right, and he had uh, the model there. And he, he was in Chelwood in his beautiful house in, uh, in New Hope. It was like, uh, there's some debate whether it was uh, Daniel Garber's house or not, but it was at this big old mansion. And it was, he used the ballroom as his studio with this giant window, which he had curtains up about halfway, so the light came from above. And he would do... Uh, uh, Portrait in the morning, usually. He was working on a portrait commission, and in the afternoon he'd do a model, uh, one of his more serious paintings for himself. And so that went on all the time. And so he had two students, one on either side. The new student, if I remember correctly, was on this side. And the student who was, had seniority had, was on this side of him. And he just, you know, he just painted all day, didn't say a word, painted, looked, painted, looked. And when he would take a break, uh, the students would look at his palette, 
We'll be like, oh my God, look, he mixed cadmium green with cadmium red. We get so excited, you know, it's so beautiful. And, uh, and so uh, the, the person who was new had to learn everything from the experienced person. So Nelson never said a word, and he would just, the, the person who had been there for a year would tell this person, you know, how to do the charcoal drawing, or how to do the monochromatic painting, or how to do the mud head eventually. But uh, it would take, it was about a two year long process. So one person was there for a year before that person graduated and they moved over here and then some newbie came, some new person would come. All throughout the year, people would come and try to study with Nelson and they'd ask him if they could study and he would say, no, no. But then when he was ready, like by the end of, when he was ready to kick this seniority person out, which he just decided to do. I remember my, my the day that he, uh, one of the only things he ever said to me was uh, he, when he, he looked at me one morning, he said, Bo, today is your last day. <laughs> I remember it well. So then I left, and then this guy moved over here, and then some new person came. Um, but you, <laughs> you could sort of tell in a way when he was like leaning toward a new person coming, you could just sort of like feel it, like somebody would have come that was really good, and you're like, oh boy, my time is limited. <laughs> Because he'd want to take them. Okay. Um, so I really learned to draw from Ben Long, and I really learned to paint from, uh, from Nelson. Because uh, those two years that I spent with him in his studio was when I really learned how to paint. Most people, by the time they left, were painting pretty much just like Nelson. I mean, or we thought we were. Um, and then I, I got a studio over on, I finished the Pennsylvania Academy, got a studio over on uh, Chestnut Street, 8th and Chestnut, and then uh, I'd go over and study. I, I really wanted to do, you know, take it somewhere and do these large paintings. And so I'd go over to Jefferson at the time and study uh, the Gross Clinic. So I, I was completely broke. And I would do portrait commissions. Uh, I had a few. But I would go over at lunchtime and, and look at the Gross Clinic. That was what I would take in for my lunch. And I would just sit there and absorb it. Okay. And Ben Kamahira had been one of my teachers at the Pennsylvania Academy. Uh, Kamahira, we don't hear much about him anymore, but at the time he was, he was a huge Philadelphia figure, and uh, like Sidney Goodman in a way, but they were sort of of slightly different schools. Um, it's a very psychological painting of a child and some sort of weird grandfather or psychologist or something, I don't know, but uh, that, this painting's in the Hirshhorn Museum, okay? And then when I was a senior, when I was, the year I was graduating from the Pennsylvania Academy, I think it was 1980, I, um, I, I won a Crescent Traveling Scholarship. And so that traveling scholarship sent me back to Europe, and I was able to uh, travel and see all the paintings that I, that, where my first trip had been cut short, I was able to see all the paintings in all the major museums that I wanted to, to absorb. Um, this is, was the Balthus painting. There was a, a Balthus uh, in the Biennial in 1980 in Venice, the Biennale. Um, there was a Balthus retrospective, and so I saw that show, and it really did affect me, because there weren't many representational painters at the time. It's sort of hard to believe, but there just weren't. So if you saw somebody that was doing something even somewhat representational, because everything was abex um, in conceptual, more conceptual, but then if you saw something representational that sort of struck a chord with you, then you would really grab a hold to it. So at the time, Balthus was very uh, important for me, okay? So I came back, and uh, this is an example of the kind of painting that I first started doing uh, right out of school. I had a show at Marion Locks uh, in 1981, and so I spent the, my first year out of school, I did a painting a month. I decided I needed 12 paintings to fill her space, and so I did a painting a month uh, to get ready for that show. And this is one of the first ones called Assignation. So my son is over here on the left pulling the curtain back. Can you go back to that Balthus for a second? I mean, I totally stole it from that kid over there pulling the curtain back. and um, and then. There's a sort of a, uh, is it the Edvard Monk of the, the sort of Madonna with her head tilted back, which I really sort of took that from that. There's a, uh, the little boy there is from the Virgin of the Rocks by, uh, by Leonardo. He's it's, it's like John the Baptist, I think. So I was, I was going to be in the painting. I actually had my, I was standing back here in the shadows, uh, but I couldn't make myself work. So I sort of took it out and, and stole this little line, like a little piece of uh, string hanging down from above from the John Singer Sargent painting of the Boyd children. And then uh, I needed something, though. The whole painting was sort of empty. It felt a little vapid, you know? And then one day I was on the phone, and like somebody was going to buy a painting, and then they decided not to buy it. And I got mad, so I kicked my chair, which is my favorite chair, into the middle of my setup, because I had this set up for the, for the month. And my chair wound up right there, and I thought, ah, oh, that's it. That's all I need. Like, 
distilled action, like something happened. Okay? So you see this is the little string here. That's like, I, I just completely stole that uh, little, I guess that's, I don't know if that's a string or if that's actually part of the, the paneling, but I always sort of thought it was a string. So the boy children, okay? Which was sort of, you know, slightly ripped off from uh, Las Meninas, Velasquez, okay? And this is another painting from that time, uh, Eleanor Day. Mm -hmm. And Eleanor Day and her sister, I mean, uh, Eleanor Day's sister and my ex-wife, this is called uh, Motet for the Day of Pentecost. So it's about fire and water and fire and, fire and wind and, uh, okay. This is some of the Autant paintings. So um, I had that show at Marion Locks and sold out. It went really well and I, I bought a house in Belmont Hills uh, across from Conshohocken and, uh, and I, I had sort of done a lot of the interiors and I was looking to try to do something with a little more, uh, just to sort of push my boundaries a little bit. I could have pe kept painting those interiors forever. Marion Locks actually told me, she said, Bo, I want you to keep painting nudes and chairs. Just give me more <laughs> nudes and chairs. And I was like, I'm tired of painting nudes and chairs. And she said, but they sell. I can sell all the nudes and chairs you paint. I said, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. So uh, we sort of had a little bit of a falling out. I love Marion, but we had a falling out. And I decided to do, the, at first I started doing some construction workers outdoors. And that led to an end to this whole uh, cycle of paintings. Uh, and this became the Automp series, which is life, death, birth, and resurrection. This is sort of the resurge, renasse, resurrection and rebirth thinking about The Last Judgment and Gustav Klimt's great paintings uh, and William Blake, okay? And this is uh, Tarmac. I was, uh, I was having this recurring dream that this plane was crashing. And in the dream, it was this giant plane and it would go over the hill and it would disappear. And I would know that it was going to crash, but I didn't see it. And uh, my brother was dying at the time. He posed for it there. That's him in the orange jumpsuit. He had cancer, malignant melanoma. Um, and I was reading a lot of Jung, Carl Jung, so the plane became symbolic of the self somehow. And see, I'm behind him in the blue jumpsuit, so the blue and the orange become uh, part of the plane, so it's some aspect of the self. And uh, I was working on this when the, uh, the plane crashed down in Texas, in Dallas, and the only thing that was left was that fuselage in the back. So then I, I realized that the, putting that fuselage, so the figures are life-size, so that fuselage is really large. It's, uh, I don't know, like 10 or 12 feet or something. So. Um, I was working on it and I was telling my father about it and I said, you know, I have this dream that I'm trying to uh, like exercise somehow and get out. And it's this dream of this plane crashing. And I told him about it. He said, well, that's what really happened. And I was like, what do you mean that's what really happened? He said, don't you remember that time I took you fishing at the end of the airport runway by the lake down there? And you were over on the other side because I hated fishing. I mean, every time I'd go fishing, what I you'd like, there's all those spiders and dragonflies and everything and snakes and stuff. And then like you would try to throw the line and it would get stuck in the tree and then you'd go, oh my gosh, my dad would get mad at me and everything. So I just like stopped fishing. I'd go over to the other side of the pond and I was on the other side when this airplane came by, this giant, uh, it wasn't a 747, but it was DC something. And it was coming toward me and I'm just a little kid and I'm seeing this giant thing and there, I'd never seen a commercial airline before. And it comes and it gets bigger and bigger. And he, my dad said that he could see me running back and forth, terrified. And he didn't know what to do. You know, we were on the other side of the lake, and it, but it goes over the, over the ridge of the, air, of the airport and then it just disappeared. So it landed, but I didn't know as a kid that it landed. I didn't know what happened. But that got stuck in my psyche and stuck in my brain. So when my dad told me the story, between him telling me the story and me doing the painting, I was able to exercise the dream and, I, and I, the recurring dream went away. But I always really use my dreams as sort of a starting point. Um, I mean, there are many different places to have starting points, but the dreams are definitely your, you know you own that dream. Nobody else owns that dream. That's yours. That's your mat raw material right there. Okay? This is another one of the paintings from Automps. This is called um, Object Permanence. The house tree person test is the test that they, that they give for uh, psych psychological kind of testing for, for children. House tree person. So they ask you to draw your environment, draw your house, draw your family. So um, here I'm doing an adult version of that. And I chose the title Object Permanence because I, um, it's a psych term for when you're a little child and you th you th you're seeing something and then it's gone and you think you'll never see it again. It's gone forever. I still sort of have this in a way. But um, I remember specifically being in, in the, my mother's car standing on the front seat, before seat belts, standing on the front seat. It was one of the seats that went straight across. 
before bucket seats. And I was standing there, and she gets out of the car and goes into the cleaners and drops off the dirty laundry. But she wasn't gone probably a minute, but as a you know, two-and-a-half-year-old, I just start wailing. Wah, wah, wah. And she comes back and she says, Bo, what's wrong? I'm like, I thought I'd never see you again. You know, that that's object permanence. You know, you, she's not there, so she's gone. So that's the way, that's what the painting's really about. It's about how once something's gone. So this is my family of five. I grew up in a family of my brother, sister, and my mother and father, and I also had five people in my immediate family at the time. Um, my son, Will, my son, Emmanuel. Elliot hadn't quite been born yet. He was still in the cooker, but I uh, put him over here, and we didn't know the sex, so I sort of put him in a dress just to cover all my bases. Um, that had ramifications later, but that's another story. Uh, I, I used myself as the central father figure, and I was working on it as my self-portrait, and then I saw David Lynch's uh, uh, Blue Velvet, and Isabella Rossellini was standing out there in front of the house, that beautiful scene, she's actually nude in Blue Velvet, but I, uh, so I, I sort of stole that idea and I put the woman there, then, it, then there were all five of us were there, she's sort of transparent, she's sort of disappearing, but... Uh, I realized I didn't like the self-portrait the way it was looking, so I got my friend Mark House, who was a carpenter, I got my friend Mark House to pose for me, and so it became a, a sort of a black self-portrait. Um, it turned out uh, that uh, when Amy Sherrill, do you know who Amy Sherrill is? You know, she painted the portrait of, uh, of Michelle Obama. Uh, this painting was shown in the Columbus Museum uh, shortly after it was done, and she was just a little girl in, in Georgia, and she saw it. And the story she tells is that when she saw it, she saw the black man, and she, so she decided to become a painter. Because she, she was the first person that she'd ever seen that was like her in a, in a piece of art. So um, it's nice of her to, to tell that story. Um, all right, so let's go to the next one. And this is my uh, son, Man, uh, man and Will, and it's, it's, me and, it's me and my brother, actually, uh, when I was a kid. I'd never seen a, a jet stream before. That's a commercial jet. And it was during the 60s, and my brother told me that it was the bomb. They were going to drop the bomb. And he's yelling, hit the dirt, it's the end of the world. Hit the dirt, it's the end of the world. So they had taught us how to drop and you know, like get under desks and how to protect ourselves. So there I am protecting myself from the nuclear bomb that's coming. Okay? Uh, this is a, a painting of Elliot. Uh, it's called Heartland. And so... Uh, he was posing for it. I'd found these, uh, these reeds, and I put them in this wagon, and he was posing. I wanted to do a painting sort of like, I wanted to do an archetypal painting, sort of like Blue Boy, like an American version of Blue Boy or something, something that like, would resonate in an archetypal way. Um, and so he was, he was posing for it, and uh, then suddenly <clears throat> he was outdoors, and we were working, and, and he put his hand up on his, on his chest like this. And I said, oh, that's, that's so beautiful, what is that? And he said, oh, I have a little heartburn. <laughs> so I just, I just that, the title became Heartland right then. It was just like, that's great. I like the way that the whole, uh, what he's carrying around with him is, is these, these uh, little thickets, like little faggots. And, um, and I, I, when I was a little boy, if I did something wrong, my mom would, uh, she would say, you wait till your dad gets home and he'll spank you with his belt. That's what they used to do back then. And so um, if I'd done something really wrong and she was too mad to wait for my dad, she'd say, you go outside and pick a switch. And you get one with leaves on it so it'll hurt more. So I'd have to go outside and pick a switch and bring it in and you know, pull my pants down and she would like thwack me like that. So I had this like vision of like, if, if I carried around all the sins, all the bad things I'd ever done and carried around with me, which is what we do, that's what we do. We carry everything with us. Then this is sort of what it would be like. I'd be just like carrying it around with me everywhere I go, just like trailing along behind me. But I like the way it's sort of like a self, strange self-portrait. Like his hair is like the thickets and the shirt is like the, the wagon and the shoes are like the little wheels. And it's just like this squeezed down little surrealistic thing. <laughs> okay, go ahead. That's Elliot. Okay. Picasso, the Philadelphia Museum. Okay. My painting, Lamb, which is in the Greenville Museum. It's Terry Beck, who is a great dancer from Philadelphia. He's a good friend of mine. And uh, I'd wanted actually to, to have a, a real lamb with, uh, with a wool on it and the hoofs and everything. 
And I had gotten one from the meat factory down the Ita Italian market. They were going to you know, slaughter one that morning and give it to me. And we went down to pick it up. They had flayed it and cut the hoofs off. And so they handed it to me in a box, like a deer. And I took it back to the studio. And Terry, who's a vegetarian, uh, <laughs> held it like that forever. And it was extremely heavy, and it was still warm. Um, but uh, it became lamb, OK? This is uh, Ad Nerdrum. And a Rothko, I don't know how either one of them feel about being paired with the other, but I find it interesting. Okay. Fire. I uh, did this when I was over on Race Street. Uh, uh huh. The Fool. Did a whole series of paintings of the tarot cards. So this is self portrait as the Fool. Okay. Oh, I wanted to go back. Go back for one second because I want to talk about these little uh, balls down there. When I was, one of the, this is a good example of how something happened a long time ago influenced something. So when, when I was in first grade, I brought home a drawing uh, to show to my father. I was so proud of, of a juggler. And I had worked really hard. He was a clown. It was a version of a self-portrait. And he was, um, the clown was juggling. And the balls were going up in the air. And then there were balls going underneath because I didn't know how to juggle. I didn't know what juggling looked like. I'd seen it on Ed Sullivan show, but I didn't really know. And so to me, they just looked like they were doing this. So I drew these balls up in the air, and then there were like two or three underneath. And my dad, being sort of, a, he was a draftsman and a woodworker, and he designed furniture. He said, that's wrong, Bo. I was five. That's wrong. And I was like, what do you mean it's wrong? It's a piece of art. I'm giving it to you. And he said, no, when you juggle, the balls don't go underneath. They go up. They just go up. The next time I did a drawing, I was very careful about like how I drew my. I, I got. I started gathering facts. Next time I made a piece of art, I, I wanted everything to be right, so my dad would like it. So, uh, and, but in this self-portrait, I put the balls down below just to like you know like just to dig in my dad just a little bit. Like it's okay. The balls are down below. There they are. The three juggling balls on the floor. Okay. And this is the magician, my friend Eric Bazilian from. I don't know if you know the Hooters. Did anybody know the rock band the Hooters? They were around for a long time. Uh, Eric wrote the song, What If God Was One Of Us, for Joan Osborne. It was a, a big song. This was 1996. This was right around that time with his wife, uh, Sarah, the magician. Uh -huh. And The Bride, I did this uh, uh, in Chad's Ford, actually. Um, there's a pastiche. You can see the uh, Caravaggio-esque. It's not, it's not one Caravaggio. It's like two or three that are all thrown in together. Um, I'd had a, a, a vision uh, of, uh, of, of what we are. I was, I was laying in bed one night and I had this vision. Uh, it was the light. It looked like a, um, um, Henry O. Tanner's, uh, what's that painting? The Annunciation? You know that one? Is that in Philadelphia still? Amazing painting. So you know the one? It's uh, you know, the, the visitation of some sort. The Virgin Mary sitting over here and there's just light, this whole yellow light. Do you guys know that painting? Heads going up and down. Yeah, it's an incredible painting. You've got to see it. Anyway, so I had this vision one night. I was lying in bed. It was the middle of the night. And this light was up on the ceiling. It was really true. It was really there. And it was giving me information. It was not in words. It was just in light language. And it was giving me, word, uh, it was giving me information. And what it said was that uh, this was the turning point of your life. And it said, uh, we're made up of two halves, a light upper half and a dark lower half. And uh, you should let the battle rage between the two halves. And it was just telling me all this, not in words. It was just like, <laughs> and uh, not in images, in light language. And uh, so I sort of didn't believe that my lower half was like this dark lower half. It's like, yeah, sure. And so like I looked down and there's just dark gray abyss that goes on forever, infinity of abyss of dark gray cragginess. And so like, okay, I got it. And so I'm, I'm, I'm laying there in bed. And then it, it showed me, it said, energy flows away from us like water over a mountain. And it was just like this vision of like energy, the way energy flows away from each one of us. And it said, you may have to lose your will. I didn't say it in words. You may have to lose your will. And so I had that moment right at that time. It was sort of starting to fade a little bit. My son, Will, was uh, in high school. And he was graduating and going off to Chicago. So I was very sort of terrified. I started thinking about my son. I was thinking back in real life again. And then I started thinking about Abraham and Isaac and like losing your will. You might have to lose your will, like losing your son. So I did this painting that was sort of about all of these things all at once. I call it The Bride. It's where reality, sort of reality of Chad's Ford out the window sort of morphs into the painting, the picture in the small church behind, behind this bride where something's happened. Okay.
It's called Dreamland. So these are some of my characters, some of the tarot characters that were in the other paintings. The magician, the fool, the bride. Okay? Uh, Eric, I wasn't going to have Simon in the painting, uh, but Eric couldn't get a babysitter. So he brought it, brought, and we went out on Valley Forge, and he was holding him. So I was like, this is great, too great. Okay? Uh, this is Andrew Wyeth. I was going to do a, uh, I'd, I'd spent, I'd spent, um, from 91 to 95 with Andrew Wyeth because Betsy Wyeth uh, had called me on the phone and invited me out to Chad's Ford. This was 15 years after I tried to go out there and scared her, when I scared her. And she called me on the phone and invited me. She didn't know I was the same person that had scared her. She didn't know I was Rasputin. Rasputin. Um, but she had in, called me and invited me uh, because I had sort of grown, uh, gotten a little bit of renown in Philadelphia and a little recognition. And she wanted to just, and I had a show in New York uh, in 1990, which uh, I thought was my best work at the time, but had gotten a bad review in the New York Times. Uh, Roberta Smith didn't like the paintings. And so uh, Betsy was just being nice, I think, when she called me up on the phone and invited me out to sort of nurture me up a little bit. And so uh, I went out, and uh, the Wyatts were so nice, and uh, they bought paintings. And uh, Betsy saw in my resume, in the back of one of my catalogs, that I uh, actually uh, made films. I'd been to NYU and to film school because I wanted to make some movies. And so she said, I, I want to make a film on Andrew. Will you help me? And I said, yeah, sure, I'll help you. I'd never made a movie before. <laughs> I'd only done film school s stuff. And I said, yeah, I'll help you. And so um, then we, uh, the next five years, I was with them every day. And that was uh, a great education because I sort of learned how to draw from Ben and how to paint from Nelson, but I didn't really quite know like, how to mo stay motivated throughout a whole long career. And Andrew Wyeth had done that already. So it was, it was a great, it was the perfect timing for me. So after my time there, um, I, I did this in honor of them. And so this was Andrew with Betsy, and they're out on uh, Snow Hill, on the hill right at Kerner's and Chad's Ford. You see uh, Painter's Folly, that's where uh, Howard Pyle had lived over there to the right. That's why NCY, that little tiny thing that looks like a little house, that was uh, Howard Pyle's house. And, but NCY was killed on the train tracks, and that's the smoke from the train you see over there uh, passing on those same train tracks right where he was killed. And this is, this is Helga. I, had, I was going to um, just put Andy in the painting initially. And uh, so he posed for me, and I, I did drawings of him, and it was, uh, I, he sat down in his studio, and I drew him a lot. We drew each other a lot anyway, but, um, and I was just going to be Andy, and he had the, the fur coat, and, and I was going to go uh, uh, take some photos of him as well, so I'd have those as references, and I, I, but my lens on my camera was broken, so I had to run down to this photo shop nearby and, and a, to buy a lens, but they only had one lens, and the lens was a wide-angle lens, and so... I, I go out there on the hill and I say, I just want to get some pictures of you now outside. So I'm taking this picture of Andrew. And then Helga's always with Andy. She was with him, she was with him every day. And so like, I, I realized that as I zoom out, trying to get focused, that like Helga comes into the picture. And I'm like, hmm, that would be interesting. So I start clicking. I take, take a bunch of pictures. And then I, I told my friend, uh, uh, Eric Bazilian, that I, I had some pictures of Andy and Helga. And uh, he said, well, you should put Betsy in it, too. Put all three of them in it. You know, you can't just put Helga and Andy. So I was like, there you go. And so um, they, with that great advice, I, I came up with this painting, Painter's Crossing, uh, of uh, Andy and Helga and Betsy. And this sort of tells the story. This tells the whole story. Okay? This is a wedding. It's the union of opposites. This is uh, what a lot of the paintings are about, the male, female, the black, white, the yin, yang, the union of opposites. Uh-huh. There's the wedding cake. It's marriage. See that she's guiding his hand very carefully. They're cutting right between the bride and the groom there. You see the shadow on her dress becomes a tower of Babel. What we've got here is a failure to communicate. This, this part's my favorite part of the painting, actually. I had painted that champagne glass. The glass is half empty or half full, depending on what you think. And uh, <clears throat> I've been working on her lips. Go back for one second. Uh, I've been working on her lips on the painting, and they were a little too red. And so I like, well, I got to get some of that red off. So I just put my thumb on her lips and took some of the red lipstick off. A fresh paint I just painted. And I was looking at it on my thumb, which had like a kiss on it. I was like, that's cool. And I was like looking at that glass. I think, oh, I'm just going to put it right there. Let's go to that glass again. And I just like put it right on there. Just so that it was actually lipstick from her lips that got put on that glass. And all of a sudden there was this whole thing that just like sort of connected the painting more. 
OK? Um, I was lucky enough to find an island up in Maine where I could go. I was up with the Wyeths, spending a lot of time on their islands in Maine. And so I was uh, able to get a little place up in Maine. So uh, this is one of the first paintings that I did uh, uh, out in Maine. Uh, the good old days, it's called. OK? And this is called the dowry. OK? You see it's inspired by uh, one of the Andrew Wyeth paintings, uh, Young America, which is at the Pennsylvania Academy, and Elmira Gulch over there. <laughs> I love The Wizard of Oz. OK, next. Uh, Winslow Homer's uh, Fog Warning. Uh -huh. And then my painting, Lifeboat, which was very directly and intentionally inspired by Fog Warning. I was in midlife. I was totally in midlife. Uh, and so every painting has a joke title. This joke title was Midlife Boat. That's what I called it, because I was right in the throes of midlife. Um, he's, he's rowing. He's thinking he's going out to save somebody's life, but really, you know, he's probably uh, at great danger, at great risk. There's a shark over here. I don't know if you can see it under the water. Uh, a fin. He's seeing the darkness of it. There's a couple of sharks, actually. But in a way, the whole thing becomes like a shark. Like there's the, the fin right up here. And then there's the, the upper part. The, his head is almost like the eye, and the un underbelly is the boat itself. So the whole thing is like a surrealistic image of a shark. Okay, so he's in the belly of the whale, but doesn't know it. Uh huh. Here's a, um, a more recent painting of that uh, sort of theme of the of going out to sea. But this guy is uh, he's accompanied. It's called uh, the Promised Land. Uh huh. And this is called Going Out. Uh, Steve Martin owns this painting. I was up in Maine and I saw my friend David Ames uh, going through the harbor with, a, with his uh, young wife in the front of the boat. Uh-huh. An assumption. I did this after 9-11, this painting I did, one of the first paintings I did after 9-11. I was working on a study of Sarah, the girl, uh, in the, over on the island. And we went back to the other side and we had to get her back up to the other island. There was, this tide, it was 15 feet, so the tide comes in and out a lot. And so um, there we were. Uh, and, we couldn't get her and the child up to the uh, to the other dock, so somebody put a, a hoist down and we hoisted her up. And I saw it happen. I actually saw it happen right in front of my eyes. It's called assumption. Yep. Yep. So uh, this is uh, Ribeiro's painting of uh, Jacob's dream. Um, the one before was my version of it. And uh, okay, let's go. I, f I saw my first Ribeiro painting when I was 18 in Florence. I was 18, and I was uh, about to go back to America to get married, and I wasn't very good yet. I could only draw, but I sort of, uh, it wasn't a deal with God necessarily, but I was still very religious, having grown up in Georgia and being Baptist, and so I made a deal, and I said, here's the deal, okay? Like, <clears throat> I'll go back, and I'll get married, and I'll have a kid, and all that stuff, but I, I, what I don't, I don't want to like do what my father did, which is like go into the family business, right? Like I don't want to like stay there and become a worker. I actually want to like be a great artist. So I'd seen my first Ribera painting during those days. I saw it at Petey Palace, and uh, I thought I want to be good as Ribera. So that was the little deal. I, I want to be as good as Ribera. That was my goal when I was 18. So um, uh, this one's actually the Pied Boite, which is in the uh, the Louvre. Okay. So when my son, this is my son Will, and uh, he posed for this up in Maine. And his name is actually William Ribera Bartlett. I named him after Ribera to always remind me. And uh, you see how his foot is sort of um, uh, like a club foot. I've sort of like put his foot like that just to remind me. And uh, he's carrying this bone like he's sort of carrying his cross. Uh, we'd actually found a whale. We, had, uh, in, in, uh, we were on the island. We were walking around the island. And it smelled so bad. And we we're like, what's that stench? And so we went up over the rocks and we found this whale. And it was so, you could hear it before you could see it. It was buzzing, like it was going and There was all these flies and maggots and everything. It was incredible. But I, I realized, uh, we saw right down in front of it, it was a dead whale, but right in front of it were these two uh, mandibles, whale bones, in a little tide pool. And they were white, bleached white. And the whale hadn't been there that long. But I, I asked Will, I said, pick that thing up and let's go. Let, let's go. And I, I, gotta, I gotta have that. So he put it over his shoulder. And as soon as I saw him, I was like, that's a painting right there. I'm gonna do that painting. And so um, he, he posed for it. And we always had this little bit of disagreement because Will always, uh, at the time, said that I told him if he posed for it that I would give him the painting, which I might have said, but I didn't remember saying it. 
So later I gave him a little study for it, um, <laughs> which is not, not what he wanted. Okay, so uh, let's go next. And this is, uh, I did this after 9-11 as well. There's, you see the bone up here in the corner, that's a little piece. This is my studio uh, in Belmont Hills. I built a studio onto the house, and this was right after 9-11. It's called The Box, and it's a, a boy and a girl playing dress up as a as young, like, like a married couple, wearing their parents' clothes, trying to be grown-ups. And the box is open, and she's pulling out a Don't Tread on Me flag, and American flag, and war memorabilia. You see a whole little sanctuary altar over there of a young couple's wedding portrait and uh, some communion wine and there's there's a little Popeye I am what I am with that funny little dunce cap on the little fool's cap okay Leviathan uh, I was at that point you know I kept wanting to do this painting of, of uh, sort of Jonah and the whale I couldn't figure out how to do it and so uh, when I found the whale and I saw the blubber thrown up over the whale, it really dawned on me how I could do that painting because I saw the way it just folded back. And so then I realized I could put a, a, a person in the whale. So my son, Man, is in the whale wearing that wrap. That wrap is what Michelangelo used on all of his slave figures and his crucifixion figures. Um, I posed as the central figure. Will posed as the African-American guy, which came straight from Copley. Uh, Watson and the Shark, Elliot, and... Uh, a young version of their mother when they were, she was 15. So it's about the union of opposites again. It's this big giant phallic shape with this vulva mm -hmm. opening up, someone being born out of it. So it's the male and the female, the union of the male, uh, union of opposites. Okay. So there's the central figures of, that came from the top of that. Uh huh. Next. And uh, Damien Hirst's shark. I don't know the title of that. Uh, what is, does anyone know the title? Something like the impossibility of a person living to comprehend what it means to be dead or something like that. <clears throat> okay. And then this is uh, Norman Rockwell's uh, Connoisseur. Uh-huh. And this is my painting um, of the combining the two things with sort of looking at the Damien Hirst idea, looking at the shark. Uh-huh. Your art goes as deep as your love goes. Andrew Wyeth used to say that. Um, and so, um, let's go to the next slide. Next. Oh, that's hard to see. Sorry about that. It's uh, Tornado Man, or the Parabolist. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, I've always loved The Wizard of Oz. Uh-huh, go. When, uh, when I was... Uh, I traveled around the world, um, midlife happened, I sort of got uh, separated and divorced and traveled around the world, and I wound up, found myself in, uh, in uh, Seattle. Uh, I was having a show at, the, at the, uh, the Fry, and when I was there I met Betsy. And uh, so uh, the Emerald City is what they've always, is what they call Seattle. So in a way it's like, a, it's, it's, it's these heading to Oz, heading to the Emerald City. Uh-huh. Wow, that one's really retroactive. Sorry, it doesn't look like that. Uh, it's the way it's reading it. Um, the Good Traveler, it's called, okay? Um, the Cruel Fair. Uh-huh. A Miraculous Outcome. Mm-hmm. Burning Broom. Mm-hmm. North Country. Think of it as a self-portrait as a horse. And Betsy, Betsy sort of in control and calming it down and uh, saying it's a circus down there. Let's, you know, think about where we can go now. Uh-huh. This is blind painter. I actually went blind. Uh, how long after we'd gotten married? Like a week? Two weeks after we got married up in Maine, uh, 2007. I uh, was painting a self-portrait. I was painting it, and I noticed that I couldn't see it. It's like, <laughs> so I never had that. I thought maybe I was getting cataracts. And I looked in the mirror, and I couldn't see myself. And I didn't want to say anything to Betsy about it, so I tra kept trying to paint for three days, and the painting was just getting worse and worse and worse, um, I guess, because I couldn't see it. Um, and finally I said something. I said, I, I, I am having a hard time seeing. And she said, well, we've got to go in. So we went on, you know, you, you never, when you get on the island, you never want to go off the island. 
But we had to go in, and we go on shore, and we go to the eye doctor, and the eye doctor examines my eyes. He says, your eyes are fine. I'm like, great. We're good to go then. He says, no, 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 because you've got a problem you can't see. We've got to get you to the hospital. So they take me to the hospital, and it turns out I had a pituitary tumor. And it was right in the optic chiasm, and that's this, right in the center of the skull, and that's where the uh, pituitary hangs down like a little uvula, and it affects all of your hormones. And uh, <clears throat> it, it, the optic nerves go on either side of it, and it had grown so large that it was blocking the optic nerves. And if I'd waited much longer, it, you know, if Betsy hadn't been there, I would have been gone right now because uh, the carotid arteries run through there as well, and it would have been blocking them next. So uh, they took it out, which was great. And, uh, and so this is a portrait as a blind painter with a young girl. Is there a, a detail of this, the next one, or not? Nope. So uh, anyway, so uh, it, I'm trying to search where to put the paint, and uh, she's holding the paint bucket, and the church is sort of being restored as well as the, uh, the, the picket fence there. Okay. Open gate. We're always at, a, at this point. I think this, this painting as a metaphor, visual metaphor, is, is uh, one of my more successful ones because we're always at this point. We're always at that point whether to play it safe. You know, like, do we stay in here where it's a manicured yard and the mother has obviously been tending to the rose garden? Is it it's safe here? But the wind or something, something has caused the gates to blow open, and now we have to make a decision. Like, it's wide open out there, total freedom out there. Do we do that? There's a road. It could be danger. So what do we do? So it's that moment of him turning um, and looking. It's my grandson, grandson Will's son, uh, posed for this. Frankie, but it's that moment, and the telephone pole is going back into space. Okay. Radio flyer. I think it's a little Betsy. I'm sort of the patriarchal father figure, like a cartoon, you know, in Tom and Jerry. You just see the grown-ups are like partially there, just see their feet or something, uh, mumbling something. But she's like fully alive, like you know, ready to go. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. A tender age. Uh huh. Allegiance. They actually used to say the Pledge of Allegiance like that in America. My mom remembers this. Uh, you can look it up. It's it's on the, it's on the internet. Wikipedia. Look it up. There's, uh, we used to we used to pledge like that, and then. Uh, they would start, I pledge, allegiance to, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and then you'd put your hand on your chest halfway through, on your heart. Uh, but they changed it when uh, Hitler stole it from us and started using it as the Heil. And so uh, we all of a sudden changed ours you know, to just doing this part. So uh, she remembers as a child up until uh, the late 30s, I guess. Um, So it's about the flag is meant to look like, you know, the, 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 uh, it looks like a waving flag in a shirt, but it's also like the stripes of a, of a uh, concentration camp uh, survivor or a victim. So uh, it's, it's about America, okay? This painting is just called America. Uh-huh. This is called Trophy Day. Once when I was a kid, I, uh, I, I was playing at the Peach League. I was in the Bears. I was number 42 on the Bears. And uh, I wasn't very good. I played right field. I sucked, actually. But I played for three or four years. And uh, my fourth year, um, it was trophy day. And I remember uh, Coach Money uh, go, co co going out in the field. And uh, it was time to award the awards. And he awarded the first big trophy to... Uh, uh, Mike Strickland for MVP. Mike Strickland was like this tall. And he was like so strong. And he hit home runs all the time. And all the other boys that we were all sitting on the bench like looking at him like, hey, hey, Mike. And then he got another little trophy about this tall. And he said, and this trophy goes to Bo Bartlett. And I'm like, what? What? Like, why? And so it's the Sportsmanship Award. <laughs> So I go over there and I take it and I'm so proud and I don't even know what a sportsmanship award is, you know. And so we go back over and, you know, they're handing out some more awards and I look up at him and I ask him, I say, why did you, like, why did you give this to me? And he said, because you never complained when I wouldn't let you play.
Okay. This is called Easter. This is a southern, a real southern thing. This is the Cemetery of the Confederate Dead. This cemetery is right near my studio, our studios in, in Columbus. And uh, it is uh, Confederate dead. They actually fly a Confederate flag. And um, these are soldiers that died in the Confederate War, uh, in, the, in the Civil War. This is uh, <clears throat> Alfred Iverson was the uh, general who single-handedly lost the Civil War for the South. He was a... Uh, his father was a, a senator, senator, Senator Alfred Iverson, and uh, he was, uh, so when his son, who was our cavalryman out west, when the Civil War started, he came back. He was really dapper and debonair. He looked like uh, Clark Gable, uh, so they let him become a general, and uh, he was uh, in charge of troops at Antietam when, when the South lost the Battle of Antietam, and then he was in charge of troops at Gettysburg when they lost to the Gettysburg. And so General Lee was furious. He said, you just go back to Georgia, just stay out of harm's way. So he was in charge of Georgia when Sherman came through. So uh, he finally just wound up down south. He just drank too much. They said that he, he was uh, a general, that he was, uh, when Gettysburg was happening, he just kept, he was, stayed behind the lines and kept drinking and telling soldiers, you just keep going out there and fighting. So they just died soldier after soldier. Anyway, he's buried. His father, Senator Alfred Iverson, is buried here. And he was the person who actually said, we will rise again. His father, Senator Alfred Iverson, actually, that was his quote, meaning the South will rise again. So I sort of combined that story of the Civil War with the Easter story of we will rise again. You know, it's like a resurrection. So I like, put those two things together and crammed them together. The series was called uh, The Lacuna which means the gap. So uh, there's a guy back there, you can see him walking away, sort of a homeless guy in the cemetery, but he's sort of, the, it's Easter morning and the women have come and he's the stranger in the cemetery. So it's sort of got this strange religious thing. My son Elliot, my youngest son Elliot was 27 and he passed away at this time when I was working on this painting. And so that's, uh, there's some fresh ground that's dug there on the bottom right hand side for a fresh grave. You see the little tear on, on, her, on her dress there. She's holding her hand there, like, uh, quite a bit like Heartland. Okay? There's a self-portrait of Alfred Iverson. It's called a Confederate. Made myself look a little like Rhett Butler. Clark Gable. The Lost Cause. Okay? This is Blind Tom Wiggins. There's a series of paintings of people that came from my hometown that were well known. Alma Thomas, the painter Alma Thomas, who had paintings in Obama's White House in the uh, Oval Office. Uh, uh, um, uh, Ma Rainey, Queen of the Blues. Uh, Dr. Pemberton, who in invented Coca-Cola, was from Columbus. Uh, blind Tom was a slave, but he was blind, so he couldn't uh, couldn't do any work. So the uh, Buford was that his, the, the owner? Buford uh, let him play the piano to entertain the family, and he was a genius. Uh, and he, he he just played the piano constantly, and he became a famous famous. He was the first blind black famous musician in America. And Mark Twain is Mark Twain's favorite musician, and he went around the country and he went to Washington D.C. and played for the presidents. Made a million dollars back then, but he wound up being penniless because Mr. Buford kept all the money. He was penniless when he died. Uh huh. Carson McCullough's was from Columbus. The heart is a lonely hunter. Uh huh. This is my portrait of Asher Lev. Self portrait is Asher Lev. So, uh, this was who I emulated when I was 18 when I moved to Florence. He became famous for doing that painting, the, uh, the Crucin Brooklyn Crucifixion. I had always had aspirations like that. Uh -huh. This is a painting of my house. That's my childhood bedroom. Uh huh. Another painting from the backyard. See, what I felt like was that, what I feel like is that you have to paint what you know. You know, they say when you write, write what you know. Right, when you paint, paint your own backyard. So I, did, I took it literally. Uh, this is a painting of my childhood home. So, uh, 
It doesn't really have this kind of ooze coming out of the windows, but there are plenty of psychological things that happened there over the years, so I needed to put it in there to make it feel like it really felt. I mean, it's a perfectly nice white house, but, but I, uh, I gave it its drama, okay? And then this is Betsy in the backyard. I call it home. Mm -hmm. This is uh, School of the Americas. So what I, what I did was I, I, I did a triptych. So the home painting was in the center. And on one side, I put the School of the Americas, which is the school where they train Contras, literally, at Fort Benning, Georgia, right uh, at the edge of town. So uh, I had a friend, Father Roy Bourgeois. And Father Roy uh, was down in uh, Central America. And when uh, these nuns, these friends of his, were um, slain, he had, he had been living in this little uh, church, a little church there, and then he went down to town to the market one Saturday morning, and when he came back, they were all in the grass. Four nuns had been slain. So Father Roy started asking, well, who did this? And it turned out that these troops that had been trained by Americans uh, in Fort Benning had done it. So he, um, he moved to Fort Benning, to the out, right outside the gates of Fort Benning, and he actually started uh, a protest called the uh, School of the Americas Watch. And that protest was to raise awareness of what we were doing, who we were training there, and why. Uh, so I used to go down there to that protest in November, every November. And what would happen was they would, the, the girls from the different schools up here, LaSalle and St. Joe's and all of the, uh, the Catholic and uh, the Jesuit schools would all come down and protest. And they'd protest by doing these die-ins. So they'd lay on the grass and throw red paint on themselves. So this could be an interpretation of one of the die-ins, or it could be the actual slaying. I had Betsy pose as one of the girls, and then actually her good friend Lark, who's a law our lawyer, posed over here, our accountant posed over there, and An Annalisha, who was our studio assistant at the time, posed down here. I just got up on a ladder and looked at them and drew them over and over again and took some photos, okay? And this is School of Charm. This was the other, the other side of the triptych on the left side. So it's two sides of Georgia that sort of what's going on out in the greater world, and then this was my memories of childhood growing up. I actually did go to Mabel Bailey's School of Charm. It was right down from my house, right in front of the A&P on 13th Avenue. They taught us how to walk with a book on our head, and how to dance, and how to have charm, and etiquette, and manners, and grace. Those were the days. Long gone. Betsy posed as Mabel Bailey. I found out years later, I, was, I think I was around the time I was doing the painting, I talked to my dad, I was telling him I was doing this painting, and he let me know that he'd had a, an affair with Mabel Bailey. <laughs> well, that seems fitting. Okay? That's my dad on the right, my mom. They've come a long way from that early portrait of him, where he's standing so proud and she's quiet. Now she's looking right at us. That, and it, again, it's inspired a little bit by the David Hockney, that one of the triangle behind his parents. You might know that one. Um, they're sitting on this love seat with space between them. There's a little piece of light. You know, you can barely see it. It's right there. <clears throat> when the canvas was in my, my studio, I was, had this uh, studio at the house. And uh, it was back in my studio, and one Christmas, my son, Emmanuel Mann, who lives in New York now, he's a performance artist and a minimalist, minimalist artist and uh, social media artist, and he makes music, uh, drone music. But anyway, so he wrote this little, little word on the canvas, the blank white canvas. He wrote right near the center, he wrote the word yes. It was this big, in pencil, in this very fine little pencil script. So anyway, I didn't know he'd done it. He did it one, you know once when he was staying. So I start the painting, I get started with the painting, I'm going to do, put it in premature over it, and I'm starting, starting to block it out. And then I see this little word. You know, like it's just, it's so, spatially, it's like so weird. It's this little tiny word way down there in space on the white ca canvas. So I, I leave it, because I think, well, I'm going to honor man. I'm going to leave it. And it, it was a reference to Yo, Yono, Oko, Yoko Ono's famous, when she put yes up on top of this uh, ladder, that's when John Lennon climbed the ladder in a, in a gallery, and it, up on top of the ladder it said yes. And that was the moment where he fell in love with Yoko Ono. So man was sort of referencing that when he put it on the canvas. Anyway, so I start painting around it. I think, I don't know what I'm going to do with this, but I, I do my whole painting, and I just leave it white. So right where that little piece of sunlight is, right there where it's sort of streaking through from the west, um, if you look real close, there's the word yes right there. I just left it the whole time. There are the juggling balls. 
just to remind my dad that they can be down below sometimes. There's the chair that's turned over. Great drama has happened here, but they have survived. Okay? One time I uh, had, had had a show in New York, and I was, I was uh, it was the day after the show. It was a Friday. And I, my dad, and we were all in this nice hotel uptown. And uh, I said to my dad, I said, come here, I want to take you somewhere. So we go, and we get in the rental car, and we drive out to Flushing Meadows. And we go out there. Because when I was a kid... Um, he told me we were going to go to the New York World's Fair. And it was, what year was that? Anybody know? 64 maybe? 65. 65. So I was like, we got so excited. We told all our friends at school the whole year, we're going to the World's Fair. We're going to the World's Fair. Summer came and went and he never took us. We kept bugging him and asking him and saying, why didn't you take us? Don't, don't say things that you can't see through. Don't make promises you can't keep. We just bugged this man, poor, poor man. We bugged him all the time. We said that for the rest of his life. So I took him out there. I drove out there. And we, we stood, me and him, me and my dad, side by side. And I said, why didn't you take us to the World's Fair? You know, it was the first time I had the adu adult conversation with him about it. He said, I don't know. I probably just couldn't afford it. And I thought, you know, there's so much love in that. Like instead of at the time telling us, we can't afford it. He didn't tell me that. He just kept mum while we just badgered him the whole time so that we felt secure. We didn't feel insecure, like, oh, my parents don't have any money. We felt like my dad just hadn't kept a promise. So years later, he tells me, tell me it's just, it was just we couldn't afford it. Probably. Homeless. This is a, a recent painting. Going to a museum in Mississippi. This is I, I've been with, when we, since we've opened the Bo Bartlett Center down in Columbus. We uh, Betsy and I opened the Bo Bartlett Center. We have uh, outreach programs, and one of them is where we have we go into the schools, and we haven't uh, been doing that as much this year. But the schools are going to start coming into the center and studying the paintings. Um, we go to jail on Mondays. I go to jail on Mondays, and uh, work with the inmates. Just give them a, a chance to express themselves. And on Thursdays we go to the homeless uh, shelter, uh, safe house. And uh, we have a program called Home is Where the Art Is. And uh, just give them an opportunity to paint. And it's been really a great program. They really draw and paint. And uh, a lot of them have uh, gone from being homeless, living under trees, to, to having, uh, selling their work and getting a job because they get some sense of autonomy and getting apartments. Um, so it's been a very successful program. Uh, this is one of the painters, Anthony. A lot of the painters are now on the streets and they actually are painting and selling stuff on the street instead of panhandling. Um, so they're making some money. Uh, this is Anthony Boston, uh, uh, one of the more talented painters, and he has his ups and downs, but I got him to get out and uh, pose for me on a bike, and I've done drawings of him, and I've done several paintings of him, okay? This is called The American. The paintings lately have been dealing with issues uh, that are less just personal and more uh, like the deal issues we all have to deal with. So like, you know, homelessness, we all got to deal with it. Uh, the gun problem we all have to deal with, uh, especially living in the South. You, you just really uh, f confront it. I mean, right now in Georgia, there's a law of guns everywhere. I mean, that's actually the law. You can have take guns everywhere, except for into the state house where the legislature legislators are. They don't want guns in there, but everybody else can have them. So uh, you can even have guns in churches. Unless the church says, no, we don't want guns, and then it becomes a big political thing. I talked to some of the preachers in Columbus. I was like, all right, you've got to make a rule that you can't have any guns here. And they're like, well, if we did that, then like half the, half the congregation would leave. So, <clears throat> but there are a couple of churches in Columbus that do have no, no gun policy. Uh, yes, the problem we all deal with. And the, the, uh, the, the, um, the painting is in... Uh, uh, Orlando, the Manila Museum in Orlando. <clears throat> and I used a self-portrait to pose as the guy because I wouldn't want anybody else to have to do it. Next. This is uh, Halloween. I sort of used uh, Spielberg's uh, E.T. as a starting point. My son, Elliot. Elliot and I used to pose. Uh, Elliot and I used to always dress up. We, we, we'd wait too late. We wouldn't get our costume ready for Halloween. So we'd always just wind up painting our face and making skull faces on, as our Halloween costume. So this was Elliot uh, going out. 
<clears throat> One time when I was a kid, I, uh, I, um, I had wanted to go out trick-or-treating, and my dad didn't want me to stay out very late. He said, you have to be home by 9. And I said, okay, I can be home by 9. And uh, he said, so we're going to synchronize watches, which was a really funny, like World War II thing, kind of thing to do. So he, he, he put a watch on himself, and he put a watch on me, one of his big watches. I was just a little kid with a little skinny arm. He put this big watch on, and it was, uh, you know, you got to be back by 9. So I'm out trick-or-treating, having a great time. I mean, I'm just like filling up my bags, you know, and I'm way down by St. Elmo's School, a mile away. And I happen to think, oh, yeah, 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 that's right. I'm supposed to be home by nine. I look at my watch. It's five minutes to nine. I take off running, candy flying. I can make it. I can make it. And I get to my back door. I get to my, I get to my driveway, and I glance at my watch. It's nine o'clock, and I, I made it. I run up to the back door, and I grab the door handle, and it's locked. Shake it, and it's locked. So I knock on the door. My dad comes to the door. He takes all the time he wants. He comes to the door. He looks at his watch. He says, you're late. I said, no, it's nine. It was nine. Look, it's nine. It's like nine something in a few seconds, you know. He's like, no, you're late. You said you'd, you'd be home by nine. I locked the door at nine. And so um, I got in trouble. I got a spanking. Uh, and or restriction. But I got punished because I wasn't fast enough. That's the way it was. So it's a trick or treat. You never know what you're going to get. Anything can happen and will. This is the Samaritans. It's part of the Lacuna series. Uh huh. Galilee. See, I'm thinking that here, I'm thinking like, uh, I'm thinking about the Titanic, you know, and like when the ship was going down, but they just kept playing the instruments anyway, you know, and the icebergs are melting, and we just like, we're still just like having a good time. We like partying, we have our parties, we listen to our music, we play our music, we make our stuff, but like, what else are we going to do? Okay. Dominion. This is Dominion. Diaspora. Uh-huh. Triumph of romance. Your heart goes as deep as your love goes. Uh-huh. Idea, energy, power. We're going to finish up here. We've got just uh, about three or four more. And so, um, this, this, has anyone ever read the book? I bet you, I bet you haven't. If anybody's read it, I'll give you five dollars. Has anybody read The Mind of the Maker? That was a close one. Um, the Mind of the Maker by Dorothy L. Sayers. Find it. Read it. It's a great book. And it's about, um, she has this one area, the one section where she talks about the idea, energy, and power. Idea, energy, and power. Is she thinks of it as like, <clears throat> the book is interesting, okay? You've got to deal with it. It was like done back in the days with C.S. Lewis and all those guys. She was friends with those guys. So it was written back in the early 1900s when, uh, you know, it was all, it's more patriarchal kind of language and that kind of thing. So anyway, but she thinks about, the creative process and creativity and the artist like uh, she compares it to the God concept okay so Father Son Holy Ghost it's a it's a tr triangle it's a trinity trinity and so idea energy and power so when you're making your artwork this works really well for somebody who like was raised in that kind of mindset when you're making your artwork um, you have an idea so whatever your painting is whatever you want to paint about it's your idea and then you have your energy. That's the amount of effort or work that you put into the idea, into the completion of the idea, right? 
before, between the idea and the completion falls the shadow. But then you have the power. The power is the third part of the, of the triangle, which is the completion of those first two. And that is how well in balance it is. That's where the power is. All right, stay with me. Because it's about, it's about idea, energy, and power is... So if you think of... I, I can't give you any perfect examples because they're not examples in the book, except for having to do with writing and stuff. But if you think about... Uh, maybe think about like uh, um, Keith Haring. Okay, Keith Haring. You know what Keith Haring looks like? Little line drawing, line paintings of people uh, doing things, all sorts of things. Um, but it's an idea. And he does a certain amount of effort and a certain amount of work to get that idea completed. And those two things are in balance with each other. Like his idea and his, the way he went about painting it and the amount of energy and time that he went about painting it are in a kind of balance. And those, therefore, there's a kind of power in that work. All right? Um, um, I'm not going to diss on William Blake, but, but William Blake, okay? So William Blake, he had great big ideas. I mean, those things are powerful ideas, like Nebuchadnezzar and stuff, and like life and death and resurrection and stuff. I don't even know what all that stuff is. It's big, giant, deep, archetypal ideas. But he did these little watercolors of them. He did these little drawing, little watercolors. And they're beautiful, but like there's a little bit of a scalene triangle because it's like the idea and the way the effort, like there's not quite... In perfect balance. I hate to say that about William Blake. But also Ang, right? John Dominic Ang. It's like, all right, it's not much of an idea. Pretty lady sitting there. But like, oh my God, he worked forever on it. It's like, uh, it's a scalene triangle this way. It's like, eh, it's, it's good. It's like, it looks good. But it doesn't like, oh, grab you. You know, it's not like, ah, alive. Because it's a little bit out of balance somehow with it. Not, I'm not being mean to Ang. It could be anybody, but that's just a rough example. You know what I mean. You've got to have the idea and the energy got to be in balance for the thing to really have power. Idea, energy, power. Okay? This is Hiroshima. I did a series of paintings when I won a pew, and this is one of the paintings from that series. Um, I won the pew in 93, 1993. Right after I'd had that spiritual visitation. So this is the turning point in your life. Uh, wanted a couple of days after that. And um, I wanted to do, I, I told when I submitted for the pew that I, I wanted to do paintings about war. I wanted to do paintings about not heroic aspects of war, but the results of war, women and children, the difficulties of war. So this painting, I started it, it was going to be, everyone was going to be dead. Everybody's going to be destroyed. It was after the atomic bomb dropped. And everybody, I actually did it. It's in Grisai. It's like all these figures are piled up over here and all this destruction. And then I was reading John Hersey's Hiroshima. Has anybody read that? John Hersey's Hiroshima. Write it down. Fantastic book. It's about people who survived the atomic bomb blast in Hiroshima. And <clears throat> there's one story of a woman. This woman standing in her kitchen. Beautiful morning. The all clear had sounded in Hiroshima. The, they, would cl they would sound alarm. And they would say that the all clear, no bombs were going to be dropped that day. And they were, uh, her children were asleep on the mat behind her, on the little mat, the straw mat. It was a beautiful morning. She's looking out at the beautiful morning. And her, across the street, her neighbor is on the roof working. He's actually tearing the shingles off of his roof and throwing them into the ground. Because the mayor of Hiroshima had asked people along certain avenues to tear their houses down. Because if they dropped a bomb, a conventional bomb, in Hiroshima, and it burned, then it wouldn't burn the whole town down. It would just burn up to these lines and stop. So this man's tearing his house down, voluntarily. And she's watching. And then a moment later, this giant flash, yellow flash, happens in the sky behind him. And 15 or 20 minutes later, she's standing up. She's getting up off the ground, shaking her neighbor's shingles off her Head and her own shingles off her head and her roof off of her head and she turns around and her children are gone. Her house is gone. The neighbor's house is gone. Everything is gone. And she's just standing in this great wasteland. So I wanted to do this painting. The way I chose to do the painting after I, I read the, that section was instead of having it after the bomb, I took it back in time to that moment right before. And so there she is. I put her in the field instead of out and instead of in the kitchen. And her child's behind her with the carp kite, which is a symbol for courage. 
And she can hear the sound of the Enola Gay way up in the sky. She's just paused. She stopped pulling the rice from the rice paddy, and she's hearing the sound of this distant Enola Gay. It's just coming closer and closer. And I wanted to hold this moment for all time before that. The vanishing point is ground zero. It's all the way back there, uh, the, the, the dome, the peace dome, which is where the atomic bomb was dropped. That's the vanishing point. But I, I wanted that sound of that distant plane to inform that whole sky. So she, she's life size. They're life size figures. So it's, uh, I don't know, 12 by 20 or something. Okay? This is homeland. And similarly, this is uh, some, uh, the village of Saint Lo was in Normandy. And when, uh, when the b Allied troops came in and they uh, liberated, they, they drove the Germans out and they liberated it. Uh, and I think it was Patton that said when he went to the village afterwards, the village of Saint Lo was destroyed. Everything was gone. And he said, we liberated the hell out of that place. There's nothing left. These are people, villagers coming back coming back from the east, coming back to their village, right on, on Normandy, to San Lo, to see their home. But it'll never be there. It won't, it's not the same. It's gone. And they don't, they don't know yet. They're looking in expectation, in triumphant expectation. They're going to be going home, but you can't go home again. Nothing's ever the same. Okay? That's my model, Hannah, my friend Hannah, and, and uh, Terry Beck, the dancer that was holding the lamb, and Elliot down here holding that little orange floating banner, and Eric Bazillion, my friends Howard, and my friend Anthony, and Wade Schumann, and Kate. Everybody, all my friends were in the truck that I put. put everybody's bouncing along, hoping, homeland. Okay? This is Goddess. Two paintings left here. This is Goddess. Uh, I worked on this. This is Hannah, who was on top of the truck. Um, I want to do this painting that would make it feel like the moment you're, the very moment you're born. So it's, a, I don't know, it's 12 or 14 feet tall, and I don't even know how wide. But that moment you, you first come out, and you look up, and you see this great giant mother head. You're like, opening your eyes for the first time. And you're fully alive. You see this incredible, mysterious thing. I started it abstractly. I started this whole foreground. I spent about six months working on this foreground without the head. And I had everybody that I knew come in and, and work on it. So everybody, every friend, everybody that visited the studio for six months all worked on this. Hannah worked on it. I worked on it. Eric worked on it. Everybody I knew painted this foreground. We painted it abstractly to get the power of what I was trying to go for with this quilt and like how we're all connected and how it's a holistic thing and we're all connected. Then I put this big... Uh, Betsy Wyeth had given me this book of Gertrude Cosbear. There's this beautiful head. It's like that Edvard Munch uh, Madonna thrown back. A uh, beautiful photograph of this woman with her head thrown back and I wanted to sort of recreate that feeling. So uh, it's the goddess, okay? And this is God. God is uh, my friend Matthew White, who is a, a model over on, uh, in, in Old City. Uh, I painted this on Race Street. And I, was, I worked on it uh, for oh, eight months. So it's, uh, again, it's like 12 by 20 or something. And uh, I, showed it, I showed it in New York. And uh, there was the, the painting that uh, Roberta Smith uh, gave a bad review of. And um, I think context is so important. You have to be able to uh, understand context. Everything means something else in a different context. You have to be able to understand what your paintings are about. I used to try to paint bigger than I could reach both conceptually and physically. So I'd paint them giant. Like I'd push my limits because I was young and had a lot of verve and I was like painting big. But bigger than I could stretch my mind to comprehend as well. Like painting big subjects. Bigger than I could comprehend. But you put it in New York 
and you're likely to get comments about it being idiotic. Or you put it in New York and you're likely to get comments about it being like a um, Ralph Lauren model. Because everything is context dependent. The painting now lives in Mecca. One of the princesses of Saudi Arabia bought it. I think it's probably happy there. I don't know if they get it, but it's a great mystery. The whole thing is a great mystery. And our job is to paint about it and to wake up in the mystery and help others wake up in the mystery. We learn to draw and paint. We want to do it from the time we're a little kid. We just do it instinctively. We just draw and we just paint. We can't help it. It's a little inkling and an instinct. It's our job to f bring that to fruition. To not de-skill, but to skill. And then if we skill and skill and skill, and if we need to de-skill, then you de-skill. But you learn. You keep learning and absorbing from every source. And you, you, then you start driving all the horses at once. Take it all in and you get it all out. And you leave something. You leave something behind. And maybe someday somebody will see it. And some little kid will see it. And say, oh, I want to be a painter someday. And then the creativity keeps on going. We're all in it together. We've got to help one another. We've got to paint as well as we can paint. Whatever that looks like. If there's any questions, I'm good. Whatever you want, to, you, you go if you got some. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the titles seem a little bit religious, like Road to Damascus. Um, there were a few others, and I'm just wondering. I know you were raised um, in the faith, yeah. And I was just wondering if that's still something that influences you, and if it does, is it something you look for as an influence, or does it happen subconsciously? I think that, you know, the idea of let your root feed your crown is very much ties into that. So I was raised Southern Baptist, and then I, at some point I started to leave, and I left to become a Methodist, and then I moved to Pennsylvania. I became an, a Presbyterian, and then Episcopalian, and you know, was moving on up the ladder somehow. <laughs> I haven't really, like, converted to Judaism yet, but I've practiced a lot of Buddhism. You know, I think that um, um, it's, 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 being, it's honoring where you're from, and it's honoring your... Um, life traditions, and we're all put here in different places, in different situations, and the thing is to sort of take that in and, and let it be part of what you are and who you are. Uh, you don't have to shuck it totally, you know. Uh, you learn things from it and you, you let it help and make part of who you are, and you don't deny it. Um, that said, uh, you know, I don't, I don't go to church now. I would if I could find one that I thought <laughs> worked, but um, I, I, uh, I think there's a spiritual aspect of things where a lot of those teachings still resonate. I think the archetypal titles, uh, uh, the archetypal idea and a lot of those stories really resonate and have importance, archetypal importance in a sort of Jungian way. So I use them uh, because they're myths that continue to be you know, living myths. They're very much a part of our culture and our literature. Uh, so um, I think it's a very fertile ground to, to explore. For me personally, uh, it's part of the collective unconscious of, of, of what our myths are. So um, that's why I use them. So personally, um, I mean, I think I have no idea about anything. I mean, I'm dumb as a plant. I'm dumb as a plant, like looking up at the sun, like thinking like, I don't know, give me some more sunlight, you know? It's like, we, we don't, we're, our brains are just like, just like barely on, you know? Like they're just like dull. And so, honestly, and so there's so much we don't know. So I don't uh, profess any uh, great knowledge about 
proclaiming one thing or another. I think you know the be best thing to do is to say, I don't know. So I don't know. But um, the thing is we keep searching. Because there's a truth. I mean, I guess there's infinite multiple truths, but they're all truths. So search for them and speak them. Yes? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. How did I get over negative feedback? Uh, so I, I get quite a bit along the way, but Andrew Wyeth was the biggest uh, help with that because Andy got a lot of bad, bad press. I mean, you know, it's easy when you're selling your paintings for the price he was selling them for uh, because he was very popular. And I think, uh, but he always encouraged me to just, uh, you know, keep working. And uh, he, when he loved my work and was encouraging about my work, that was more important than what critics had to say to me. Um, so... Um, I think that that's the, the, the biggest thing. Uh, you know, they say all, all press is good press. That's, that's a bunch of bull. It's not. It's not. I mean, bad press, you sort of believe it, depending on where, where it is. I mean, you believe what you read in the New York Times for the most part. So, like, you know, when they say something, you're like, oh, really? You know, you can be reading the worst review you've ever read, and then you realize it's your review, and it's like, oh, man. So you, so, you know, you do have to have a certain amount of ego strength to keep going. But it, it does chisel you away. You know, I think it chisels at you. Um, and we, we met Roberta Smith up in uh, Maine a few summers ago. She and Jerry were up there giving a talk. And, and I raised my hand and asked her about it. I said, you know, how do you all feel about, like, you know, really affecting human beings' lives, these poor artists? And they said, oh, artists are tough. They can take it. And they don't care what we say. I was like, no, that's not true. <laughs> And they sort of waved their hand at me like, sit down, you know. And so I went up to her after the talk and I told her, I said, you know, I'm speaking from experience. Like, you know, you really affected my life. You really affected the course of my life. Um, but, you know, she was, uh, she was like, oh, I said that, you know. Like, uh, that's a terrible thing to say, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, she's from New York and so she's still very biting. And then she turns around and she says, but there's a little truth in everything I write. <laughs> So, you know, but I love, I, I, I love Roberta. She's a great writer, and she writes great things, and I believe almost everything she writes, except for when it's about me. <laughs> yes? I'm sorry if you mentioned this and I missed it, but I kept noticing in several paintings the thin curved flower, or diagonal slow flower. Is there a story behind the recurring? Um, you know, there, there are several stories behind that, actually, and the, the, the I was thinking about this the other day. I did a painting called Tar Men, which was these construction workers. It was one of the first paintings I did after doing the nudes and chairs. And I, I was doing this painting when uh, Move happened. Does anybody remember Move? It was, happened over in West Philly. And I was in my studio, and I was working on this painting of these construction workers. And then I, I left. I think I was riding the bus home, which was out. I was going out toward uh, Belmont Hills. And as I wrote, went by, I could see the smoke in West Philadelphia from the Move compound burning. And I remember seeing that smoke thinking, oh my God, something horrible is happening over there. You know, something really horrible, atrocious is happening. And, I, and it, it dawned on me that that was this symbol that could be like that there are these dramas going on just over the horizon that, you know, um, I'm, I'm, ex I'm, I'm painting one drama, one little tiny drama of something. Uh, but then there's other dramas that are outside the picture plane that are happening everywhere, all over at the same time everywhere. Um, but, you know, when I was a kid, we would, we would actually go burn the field behind the house. It was a, um, down there where uh, Fear of Division was, where that jet was flying through the sky and the kids on the ground thinking it's the end of the world. Um, that had been a forest when I was a kid growing up, but then when they started to tear it down, they tore it down and turned it into a field. And then eventually built a shopping center there. But, uh, you know, it went from being an idyllic place to this little shopping center. But when I was a kid and it was a field, my brother and I'd go down and light it with matches. And it would burn. And this fire would rise up. And it would get so big that we'd have to, we'd try to put it out. We just, you know, we were kids. And we'd try to put it out with our shirts or whatever. And I'd jump on it. But then it would get too big and it would keep coming toward the house. And so we'd have to go and call the fire department. <laughs> and we'd go upstairs and look out the upstairs window at the fire department putting it out. And that happened a lot. <laughs> well, we were bored, and it was Georgia. So, I mean, in some ways, I think that fire is just this like reminder to me that this stuff is going on all the time, everywhere. Um, yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, because when I was a kid, I would sit out on the field in the field and look out toward Alabama, right? There weren't buildings, there was no trees, and it was just this grassy field. And I would sit there looking at the grass, and the grass is so beautiful. It was those little, I called them brook meadows. It was like this grass with these little flying tassels like flags, you know? And I'd sit there, and I'd break one open and put it in my mouth and, and taste it and watch the sunset. Watch the, I'd sit there until the sun would set in the wintertime, and it wasn't cold, you know, we didn't have Arctic blasts back then, you know, you'd sit there in your shirt, you know, and you'd sit there and you'd just watch the sky get pink, and you'd watch the sun set, and it, but I could see all the way to Alabama from where I lived, and it was just, it was ingrained into me, the, the beauty of, like, thinking of the West, you know, this mysterious place way out there, and I was just, this, you know, and the trains would sound down in the valley, and you'd hear this train, you'd hear the the horn of the train, and it was like gonna, a train that was going to go up to Chicago or something. And there was a big world out there. And uh, so all of that got in me. And, and so, you know, when I paint, like, think about, I, you know, I put myself in that field. Um, Betsy Wyeth used to tell me, she said, you have to imagine yourself out there. You know, so you don't, you're not just like, you don't just paint something that's, you know, realistic that's sitting there in front of you. You know, you, you, you put yourself out there and you put yourself out there in, in your imagination. So it becomes your whole life. It's not just that one instant of time, which is fantastic, the instant, but it's, it's your whole life, every painting that you paint. So it's, it's, and you want it to resonate. And so, you know, that's what I think Wyeth was so great about doing. You know, if, if you're free, come see the Wyeth film tomorrow at Pennsylvania Academy. Um, it's, I don't know what time it is, but uh, six, to six to eight. If you can, get over there. Uh, but Wyeth, you know, he, he would leave his house in the morning. I know this well because I was there many times. And he would drive down the driveway. Sometimes, I swear, he wouldn't get to the end of his driveway before he'd pull over. And he would see something he liked. The light would be striking a uh, fence post a certain way. And he would just stop. And he didn't have some giant concept yet. He was just like, oh my God, he got excited by something. And he would see the light striking this fence post. And he would pull off, his, tr his Jeep would just be off to the side of the driveway. And he'd get out and he'd start drawing it. If he really liked it, he'd water start watercoloring it. But he was just excited by something. And then the next day, if he saw it again and liked it, he would, uh, he'd go get a tempera panel and he'd start doing a tempera of it. But he wasn't just painting a pretty scene. He, was, he, he knew that fence post. He knew the man that put that fence post there and what tree from the woods, what tree that had come from and the man who had strung the barbed wire that went, went along it and the piece, piece of horse's mane that was stuck on that piece of barbed wire he knew that horse's name he was painting his whole life and that's what he did, he painted his own backyard and he painted his own life and, and that's, that's what we have to do you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's not just like a, finding something that's aesthetically pleasing. Like it's, it's, you've got to get your whole life into it. And it's, it's a great responsibility. You know, it's a heavy thing. But, because your painting has to feel. I mean, it has to actually, you have to trans substantiate the paint. You know, it's not just like, you know, in the Catholic service where you, you take the wine and the bread and it, is that transubstantiation, I think? Where it turns into the body and the blood of Christ. I and mean, that's a metaphor. Uh, and when you, when you eat it, you become one with the body, one with everything and everybody. But the same is true with paint. Like, you can't just have paint that stays paint. I mean, what good is that? It's already paint. You've got to turn it into something. So you've got you to put your whole life into it. All your feelings, you've got you to... Your head and your heart and your whole emotion, every cell of your being has got to go down your arm and into the paintbrush and you've got to get that piece of paint and that paint's got to get turned on. And you've got to put it on the painting in the right place and it's got to be turned on and it's got to have life in it. And if it doesn't have life in it, there's no point to even do it. So it's, got to, it's an act of the will. You've got to just like concentrate and care so that it, it's got that quality. If it, doesn't, if it doesn't have that quality, you might as well be painting you know, a piece of furniture or something or something else was just let it be paint. And paint's great, but you gotta turn it into something else. So it's got your life energy in it. And if it's got your life energy in it, it's gonna hold it. The painting's gonna hold that forever. People are gonna look at it. They're not gonna know why they find it interesting or why they get something from it, but they will. 
they'll get it. But you gotta you gotta take charge to put it in there. It's a great responsibility. Your whole life's gotta get in there. It's a fun game. Yes. Um, you pray. <laughs> That's when you like start hoping there is a God because you pray that you get an, an idea that something will show up. But you know what? As soon as you have the intention, something will happen. I'll be going along. I won't have many ideas. And then like, you know, I'll be like taking a trip somewhere. You got to get out of the studio though. You got to freaking get out of the studio. You can't spend all your time in the studio. You got to go out. Get out of the studio, get some light on your face, and go out and see something. Because that's when it'll happen. Or it could happen at night when your eyes are closed. It, it could show up. But y you'll see stuff. And when you see stuff out in the world, then you, it'll just like, just like that. But all you got to, you can pass things all the time and not see it. But when you think, I need an idea. I, I need something new. I'm only like, that day you'll see it. That day you'll see. We went down to Miami to draw with some friends. We had a drawing group down in Miami. And... Uh, some friends from New York, we were driving down. I wanted to drive instead of fly, so we drive down. I look over and see this cow in this. I just, and, and in my mind, just moments before, I was thinking, I gotta see something, you know? It's like that moment. And, and then I look over, see this cow in this little isthmus, and it's just this, like a, reflected in the water. The cow's reflected in the water. And he's just lying there in that cow shape, and, it, and the sky's behind him. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It's just like, oh my God, there it is. All you gotta do is open your eyes, but you, it takes intention first. You gotta say it. You gotta. It's just like life. You, we can manifest absolutely everything. Like you get what you ask for. So just be real careful. You get what you ask for. So um, yeah, you, you gotta keep. You gotta keep the intention going. So, but yeah, I run out of ideas. When I get if I run out of ideas too bad and I can't come up with anything new, I just repeat an old idea. And it's different than it was the first time. But just keep on moving. You gotta, it's like when you pray, move your feet. You gotta just, Gore said that. <laughs> no, that, that's actually an old adage. Gore quoted it in Inconvenient Truth. Yeah. Um, he has an old Indian adage when you pray, move your feet. You gotta, you gotta take action. You can't just hope. There's no life in hope. You gotta work, move your feet, take action. And that's when, that's when things start to happen. What is it, the, the quote, begin it now? You know that Goethe quote? It's sort of half Goethe, it's half something else. But begin it now, because when you, when you start something, then providence moves too. So you've got to take action. So just show up every day. It, it, uh, what is it that it rebuilds when we're at our canvas, at our, our easel every morning? What is it that rebuilds in our brain? It's the uh, neuro pathways. Is that what it is, neuro pathways? Forging new neural pathways. So if if you show up at the easel and you show up at the, then you're gonna be uh, actually <clears throat> you start to get is happy the right word? And it's like the chemicals start to kick in, where you actually are forging happiness. But if you know if you're if you're doing this and you're like following Instagram and you're like, oh my God, look what that person's doing. Look what that person's doing. No, we gotta live in the 3D world. We gotta be in the 3D world. I know Instagram's great. I'm not saying it's not, but we gotta live in the 3D world and look in the 3D world and look at things. This is incredible. I mean, my God, look at this. We're like alive. I mean, that's just. I'm, I'm, it's incredible that we're alive and that we can think and that I can stand here and like have thoughts and those thoughts can get swooshed around on my tongue and like come out as words and that you can comprehend those words. And the whole thing is incredible. It's incredible that we're here, sitting here. And these chairs hold us up and that gravity is here and the whole thing. It's an incredible miracle that we're alive and that we can think and feel. And so all we can do as creatures is, is to like make some record of that and like get it down and, 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 and have a, a creative response to the fact that we're here and leave a record of what that felt like. That's all we can do, I think. Yes. John. All right. Good. Good to see you. Um, your models, uh, they're all people that you know from the first year that you sort of talk about painting your own soul or painting your home. Um, and yet, do you ever feel that even though you're painting what you know, painting people that you love, that you're expressing your 
Yeah. Um, no, I think it's a fascinating and great point. You know, it's like there's that loneliness in Wyeth that, you know, there's, there's a real melancholy in Wyeth, I think. It's a little bit like Hammershoy a little bit, you know. It's like there's that loneliness and that melancholy. It's not nostalgia, you know. It's a real melancholy, which is very, uh, it feels good. <laughs> and it feels good because it's a real feeling and in the end it's what we all it's like the Buddhist thing you know the Buddhist the, Bo the first noble truth is there is suffering you know it's like that's not an upper that's like good lord why don't I want that why don't I want that philosophy <laughs> but it's true and our loneliness is that we're all yeah we're all individuals and we're all in this world alone, and we're all coming in, and we're all dealing with our own crap, and we're all going to go out alone. And, and that, you know, we, we, we avoid death at every, we constantly are avoiding death. I mean, making art is avoiding death. Everything we do is, is, is avoiding death. But we, we, we're going to go out at some point, so we don't want to think about it. We constantly don't want to think about it. But we have to embrace the whole of it. And the whole of it is that we're not going to be here someday. And uh, so making something is about the best we can do, I think. And yes, the, there is a loneliness. But, you know, I love being alone. I love being in my studio painting all day. And so that feeling is a, there's a joyousness in that loneliness. Um, what's his name? That's Rita. Rita. Rita was the polar bear. Um, I, I'd wanted to do the polar bear for a long time, and um, I didn't have a polar bear. And I'd done little sketches from you know National Geographic or something. And it's like, well, that, you know, like whatever. And then one day I was in Columbus, Georgia, the most unlikely of places, and I'm walking down the street, and inside a Mexican restaurant is a polar bear with a sombrero on. A stuffed polar bear from 1905, shot by some expedition guy. And so I see this polar bear, I'm like, that's it. You know, and it's got a name, it's got Rita written down there. And so, um, yeah, I used that polar bear. Um, she was looking uh, straight, though, so it was real sort of, had the, it had this funny little, like, dynamic. It just wasn't, like, composed very well. So I uh, drew her head from the front, and I did her body from the side, and I sort of somewhat combined them. Uh, I played up that neck, that sort of phallic neck, you know. Uh, but, it, you know, it, nothing is real. I mean, uh, what is the David Lynch quote from that movie? What's that movie called? Uh, Shorty or no? Um, oh. The recent movie. I'm, yeah. No, it's a recent one. Lucky. Lucky. It's called Lucky. It's a cool movie called Lucky. He, he didn't make it. He's in it. But the, his quote in it is, is realism a thing? And I love that. Is realism a thing? That's what he says. And so, uh, it, and it's like that. It's like, I think about that with, you know, when you're doing something that's, you know, representational, you know, there's, there's a photorealistic way to do it. There's a romantic way to do it. I mean, there's infinite number of approaches. There's an impressionistic way to do it, you know. There's an optical affected light way to do it. There's infinite number of approaches. But in the end, you're not really painting something that's real. You're really painting something that's a painting, that's a creation, that's a, a feeling that you have, that you're trying to get down. So no matter what your starting point is, it's like you've got to get that feeling out. So, you, you know, it's, it's got to morph. It's got to change. You've got to imagine yourself there working, working on it in, on an iceberg or in a field or wherever the action is taking place. You've got to put yourself out there. You've got to bring everything you've got to it all the time, every day. Thanks. <laughs>